What are we busy with? We are busy with the seed, hey, isn't it? The seed of God and then tonight this evening we're going to have a a very intensive sort of study about where the seed went. In other words, we, were, we identified the seed, we followed the seed, now we're going to see what the seed is going to do. Now, when did the seed actually start? The seed started with Adam. Adam slipped up. Because Adam slipped up, God had to do something else. But he found Noah. Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. And he was a preacher of righteousness. And eventually Noah crossed over the flood and he then carried the seed of righteousness over into the next world. You must realize that every single person on the face of this globe died in the flood and only eight people came through and through Noah and his sons and his daughters-in-law was the whole or were the whole world populated so we are in fact coming from that lineage from Noah and his descendants we are part of his descendants we're coming from that lineage now Noah had to carry the seed through and it was taken Shem, Ham and Japheth. Then it went on and it went to Abraham, his grandson. Now Nimrod, I'm talking, I'm saying grandson because there could be sort of five or six or seven or eight grandsons before that, but I'm saying that as a lineage, as a genealogy, as part of Noah's genealogy. So Abraham eventually got into a position where he was a young man when his father, Terah, left the land of Babylon and left for the land of Canaan. Now all, all biblical scholars believe that Abraham's father was an idolater. In fact the Bible shows us something about that. But not it doesn't the Bible doesn't go too deep into that. <coughs> but then Abraham as a young man they traveled around that big desert of the, the Arabian desert. All alongside where the, the river, one of the two rivers, you got the Euphrates and the Tigris River. In between those two rivers is the land of Shinar. It was the land of Shinar or Somer. Very early people. And then they traveled all along the one river up past the desert and they went into Haran. H-A-R-A-N, Haran. And Abram's father dwelt in the land of Haran. Or Haran, some people would like to pronounce that. But Abraham grew up <coughs> and God spoke to Abraham. In fact, God preached the gospel to Abraham. We hear that the Bible tells us in the New Testament in Galatians that God, that the, the gospel was preached to Abraham 430 years before the law. So that is, uh, that is quite a long time, but obviously, you know, we cannot have in the scriptures a day-to-day -day or a month-to-month -month or a week-to-week -week or a year-to-year -year sort of account of the events that took place in those days. But I can tell you something here, yeah, people, that that's what God has put in here. I can tell you now that God has got in His divine, infinite wisdom, He took 
the word as it was written right here before us. That every single word of that 31,102 verses, King James Version. 31,102 verses in the King James Version. I love the King James Version. As far as I'm concerned, it's the best translated Bible that has ever existed. So what now happens is that <coughs> in that 31,102 verses, we find that each of those verses contains a few words paragraphs and words or sentences and believe it or not every single word of the Bible has got a particular meaning first of all it has got the written word meaning secondly what is the second thing that it contains the, the written word of God we also have the spoken word of God that is embedded in the written word of God in other words, what we call in English, reading between the lines. That's, uh, that's what it is all about, reading between the lines, eh? Now every word in every sentence and paragraph in the scriptures has, have a meaning. These meanings has little stories attached to them. Now, I'm going to give you an example. Say for instance, we have to translate a man's name from the Hebrew into English, like the word or the name Abner. Abner, A-B-N-E-R. That's one small little word with five letters in it. Now Abner in the Hebrew language means father of flame. source of flame. You get, you get your physical, literal word, you get the spoken word, and then you get the meaning behind it. For instance, if, you, if I say father of flame, then we would think of a father that, is a, that has got a son, flame. But when I speak about father being the source of life, then we have another situation coming here, that God is the Father. He is the Father of all. And from Him comes life. He is the Father of life. The source of life. Now the word Abner in the Hebrew language, for instance, means Ab means or is a part of Abba, Father. All right? Ab, Ner. Ner is flame. Ner means flame, so it's Abner, father of flame. You can describe the word of, because the word of is only found in the English languages. It, it, it almost never existed in the old ancient languages of the olden days. Father of flame. Father flame, father son. Father of Saul. Saul, father of Jonathan. Now that of is saying it's Saul, father, Jonathan. It doesn't say the word of, for instance. But for our convenience, the English language probably, uh, probably will sort of explain a little bit more as far as that's concerned. But Abner, for instance, have that particular name. If you had to have a son now and you had to call that son a Hebrew name and you decided that you're going to call the son Abner, then in the, in the real English language it would mean that you call him your son Father of Flame or Source of Flame. So if you go and register your son at the registration office that your son is born, you will register the source of flame or father of flame. And when your son plays in the garden and you don't want to call him to come and play with your toes, <laughs> then uh, you will say, hey, father of flame, come and play with my toes. <laughs> You wouldn't use the word Abner because Abner is not an English word, it is a Hebrew name. 
and it means father of flame. So that's what you would do. So within the structure of the scriptures, we find that God has built into that language a lot of truths that has to be revealed, that has to come to us in very, very, very real terms. And that is where people really sort of slip up in studying the Word of God to find out what these things are all about. Now we have followed so far in the lectures and on Sunday mornings, we have followed the seed, where it comes from, where it went, through Noah, right through, and we have all then a split coming there, that's in Seth for instance, this is a, this is a key word, believe me or not. A key word is in the likeness and image, or in the image and likeness. The image and likeness is very, very important here. You have to notice that. I'm telling you because the Bible tells us that in the likeness of his father, Seth was born. Okay? In the image and likeness of Adam. Alright? In the image and likeness, Seth was born. Remember we got Cain and Abel? Cain killed Abel, and in so doing, killing Abel, Abel was a shepherd of the sheep, Cain was a tiller of the ground, and in killing Abel, what happened there? The two concepts of God's scriptures, the one was there, <coughs> killed by the other one. In other words, the tiller of the ground, in fact, represents or means every single work of man's hands. That is what the tiller of the ground represents, the works of man's hands. The shepherd of the sheep represents the first blood, the blood of the remission of sins. The shepherd of the sheep or the carer for one's brother, okay? Very important, the carer of one's brother or the keeper of one's brother. So we've got now the tiller of the ground, the works of man's hands, destroying the keeper of one's brother. That is all metaphors that we cannot just discard or just throw away or neglect or just say forget about it. We cannot do that. It is impossible to do that because God, that is where the truth of the scriptures lie. So what we have here now <laughs> is that eventually we find that the scriptures tell us that Nimrod came forth. He was Noah's grandson. He came forth and he started this, the kingdom of Babel. <laughs> And he started the kingdom of Babel and the kingdoms of Babel with all its facets and all the aspects of the kingdom of Babel has got within its structure the world system. In other words, the world system that we know as we know it today was born in the exercises and operations and functions of those things that Nimrod introduced to the world, including currency, a single currency for a certain lot of people living in a certain area. That's why we've got the rand today for South Africa, the dollar for America, the pound for England, and so on. In those days they had the same thing, but Nimrod was the guy that started it. He was the person that started the kingdoms of Babel. Then we found <coughs> that mankind wanted to make for themselves a name and they decided to build a tower, a tower that will reach unto heaven to make a name for themselves so that they cannot be scattered abroad. That was the reason they did it. But anyhow, <coughs> God looked at this thing and he said, let us go down and look at this. And they went down and they looked at this and then they said, let us go down and destroy what the people are planning to do 
otherwise they would achieve that which they proposed to do. And God confused their languages, they, he confused their one mind and one soul, one accord and all their own their ideas that is one, and he scattered them. And they started moving in all directions. And because of that, we had then the term pioneer coming into being. The, guy, the people went and they lived somewhere. They pioneered through the, the wildernesses and all kinds of things, established their communities and they started talking their own languages and their own uh, dialects and whatever. And then, of course, we found out that the tower was a symbol, it was a symbol of Babylon. It was a symbol of the world system. Although it was a literal tower that was built at one stage, it was also the metaphor or was a symbol of the world system. And <clears throat> the world system in that particular situation was then confused by God. And God decided now that mankind has now realized that he can, with his own hands, support himself. God had to quickly separate the blessings of the kingdom of God from the blessings or the gains of the world. Or the gains of man's hands. He had to do that because previously or prior to that, man, God blessed all mankind in the same way. He didn't make a distinction between the two kingdoms at that particular point in time. But at the Tower of Babel, he separated all these things from each other and he brought in the blessings of God as being one part and the gains of the world possessions as another part. Now the reason for that is, is that I suppose, and I believe it, there's no reason why we shouldn't, is that God wanted to prevent the devil from tapping into the divine treasury of God, easily as it is, by the works of man's hands. That means that mankind could never satisfy God with what he wants to do for him, with his hands. In other words, man's, the works of man's hands could not and cannot and will never be able to buy his salvation. This is very, very, very serious there. Because man thought that, you know, he could buy his salvation. But salvation can only come through the blood of Jesus, through the shepherd of the sheep. That is why it is so necessary that we know and understand what this is all about. <coughs> and since the gospel contains God's economic system, we need to know all these things. And I'll tell you something, there's a lot of people that don't know anything about God's economic system. They don't even think that God has an economic system. Or they would equalize God's economic system with the world system of economics and finances and commerce and industry today. They would say that comes from God because most people say we are believers. And because we believers, God is blessing me in my job. And he is giving me my blessings and I should keep my blessings and put it in a bank. And those are people that could not get the same successes out of the, the, the works of his own hands, they were marginalized and they were disenfranchised. In other words, they were pushed out into the peripheral of the cities. And only those people that could make it with their own hands, they were the guys that got rich. And then, eventually, the cultures of mankind and the religion of mankind became one thing. Remember I told you last time about how the Canaanites actually complained to the Hittite kings or rulers 
that the merchants of the east, that means from Babylon and elsewhere in that area, when they came to Canaan, they interfered with their religion. They interfered with their religion. They did not say to the Hittite kings that the, the merchants of the east came and interfered with their business practices and, and policies. They came and they wrote to them and said to them that they interfered with their religion. So in other words, their business practices became their, which is their culture, and the way they grew up, that became their religion. Because they assigned unto each event that took place, like reigning over the seeds that they sowed, the plants, um, all kinds of other things that they did, they assigned unto those things, they said that they must be gods that's controlling the elements. And they called gods of death, and gods of rain, and gods of dew, and gods of rivers, and gods of the sea, and gods of the earth, and so on. And they had all these gods, eventually, uh, that they worshipped. And then came this one very, very big um, cult, which we call the fertility cult, which is the Baal worship or Baal worship. Baal worship was a fertility cult. Now the fertility cult had its origin in Babel, in Babylonia. Then it spread out over the continent at the top there and it went to Egypt for instance and the who knows the Nile Delta? You know about the Nile Delta. We, we learned about that at school. The Nile Delta. Where the Nile River, where is the source? Where does the Nile River begin? Lake Victoria. Okay? That is the source of the Nile River. And then it goes through and it ends in Egypt into the sea there and it's got well, it, why it's called the delta it, uh, it, it spreads out into various sort of fingers of rivers into the sea there and it became such a fertile area and because they assigned unto the area a god which was called the fertility cult in other words the reproduction cult and they even extended that into the human being species the human species they extended that cult into that because if you had a, 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 a good son in certain areas then the god of the fertility for fertility he was the guy that brought about your son for you in other words eventually what happened was to make a long story a very long story very short is that they assigned unto the cults and the gods that comes from Satan, in fact. They assigned unto Satan the ability to give life. And that is what we have to know. Now we're busy now with the sea. Now we're going to see that in two places, for instance, in Revelation, the 21st chapter, the Bible talks about the New Jerusalem and the twelve tribes and the twelve tribes the names of the twelve tribes and so forth and then we see in Ezekiel 48 the last chapter also the twelve names of the twelve sons of Jacob or of Israel Israel eventually Jacob became Israel then, for instance, in Genesis 49, as early as Genesis 49, now Ezekiel is very, very far back in the, uh, uh, or on in the, in the Bible. But in Genesis 49, we see the following. Let us go to the scriptures about this, so that we can get the story, what this, all this is meaning. Now, reading it offhand like this, we can make out more or less some sort of idea of what the son's names mean and what it is all about. Listen what the scripture says here. This is what Jacob's last words is to his sons. 
This is very important because the 12 sons of Jacob will play a major role in the new foundations of the new Jerusalem. It's very, very important that we know this. So let us go to the scriptures here in Genesis 49 and read the following. And Jacob called his sons and said, Gather together that I may tell you what shall befall you in the last days. Now why on earth do you think in Genesis 49 would God now or tell Jacob to tell his sons as a last speech to them? Come closer here to me, gather together so I can tell you what will happen in the last days. Now this is unique, this is, this is something that you've got to remember because we are going to refer to that later on. Gather together and hear, you sons of Jacob, and listen to Israel, your father. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might and the beginning of my strength. The excellency of dignity and the excellency of power. Unstable as water, you shall not excel, because you went up to your father's bed, then you defiled it. He went up to my couch. Reuben, he was the firstborn. Now listen to this, this is very important. Reuben, the firstborn of Jacob, he went and committed adultery with Jacob's concubine Bila. And he defiled his father's bed or his couch, as the Bible puts it. But that is not all that would have happened there. There's something much more important happened in this particular instance as far as the defiling of Jacob's bed is concerned. Of Reuben, his first son, defiling or committing adultery with Bila, Jacob's concubine. What had happened there is that there is a holy connotation, a holy name given to the firstborn. The firstborn in the scriptures means a lot more than you and I could ever expect to believe. It has got so much more than just defiling his bed by committing adultery with, his, with Jacob's concubine. It also dishonored the holiness of the firstborn. And when it dishonored the holiness of the firstborn, it also dishonored the position of the tenth, of the tithe. In other words, every tenth animal that was taken out of the counting of it to give unto the Lord was, an, was a position of the tenth. And that was symbolic of the tithe. And you could not, if the tenth animal was blemished or spotted or something was wrong with it, then you had to redeem that animal and replace it with something else. But you couldn't take the ninth animal or the eleventh animal to fill the position of the tenth animal. Because the tenth position was holy. Now the firstborn also represents the tithe. In other words, Reuben committing adultery with Bila not only dishonored his father's bed, he also dishonored the position of the tenth and the firstborn. He also dishonored the 
position of the messenger. He also dishonored everything that goes with the forerunner. Because everything that is of the firstborn, the forerunner, the messenger, the tithe, and all those particles like the first fruits were defiled and dishonored. That is what Reuben did. And that is why when he spoke to him and he said to him, Reuben, you are my firstborn. My might and the beginning of my strength. The excellency of dignity and the excellence of power. Unstable as water you shall not excel because you went up to your father's bed. In other words, the last talk that Jacob gave his sons, he spoke to Reuben and he said to him, this is what? He says, you did the same thing almost as what Esau did, sold his birthright to J uh, Jacob. <coughs> So we have a situation here that is very, very, that, that happened that, that God wasn't very pleased with and Jacob knew this. And although the firstborn had to be the one that had to carry the seed on, he defiled his father's bed by committing adultery with his concubine. So now he says to him, like, this is what is going to happen in the last days. Now we're going to get to the last days. Because then now we are busy with the beginning of days here. We are busy with the beginning of the Israeli nation. We are busy with the beginning of the Dudeka Furon. In other words, the Commonwealth of Israel. We are busy with the foundation of the city of our God. And here we have already a situation where Reuben has been reprimanded because he says he will not excel in what he is doing. He is unstable as water because he defiled his father's bed. Then he speaks to Simeon and Levi. Now Simeon in the Hebrew language means here. Levi means attached by borrow. So Simeon and Levi are brothers. And in other words, here and attached by borrowing are brothers. These two things are brothers. In other words, what you got to do first of all before you get anywhere, before you borrow anything from anybody, you will hear something. If you want to borrow 5,000 bucks, somebody's going to tell you, listen, you can go to that bank or you can go to that individual and you will hear first and hearing and borrowing is the, becomes then brother. Two brothers, okay? He says here, he says, instruments of cruelty, cruelty are in their dwelling place. Simeon and Levi. Instruments of cruelty are in their dwelling place. And let not my word enter their council. In other words, Jacob here, as, a, as the father of these sons, are very, very concerned about the situation. And he does not want their shortcomings to flourish and have dominion over the nation of Israel. That which they have done wrong must be stamped out of them. But the Bible tells us that right through that the twelve sons of Jacob, they became the center of the tribes of Israel, or they became the beginning of the nation of Israel. Now, because of that, because of these defiling situations that they have committed, it would have been an absolute miracle if they did not do that, then they would have been the nation that were the utmost and 
uttermost nation chosen by God. But God had to bring the Gentiles or every other human being also into the sheepfold because of this. Now what is he saying here to us? He says, Simeon and Levi, our brothers, instruments of cruelty are in their habitat or dwelling place. Let not my soul enter their council, let not my honor be united to their assembly. For in their anger they slew a man, and in their self-will they hamstrung an ox. Now I don't know if you guys know that Simeon and Levi were the two brothers. You know they had one sister. What's the sister's name? Dinah. Okay? Now Dinah was defiled by a lot of men from Shechem and so on. And Levi and Simeon went and they gave these guys an ear and they listened to them and, and, and these kings and rulers and people of Shechem and, and so on said that, you know, we've done this but we want your, we want your, your, your sister as my, I want your sister as my wife, this one man. So what happened was is that they agreed to it but eventually they went back and they killed all of them in their camp. And in other words, that's why Jacob says to them, that they had their cruelty are in their dwelling place. Cursed is, or cursed he their anger, for it is fierce, and their wrath, for it is cruel. And I will divide them in Jacob and, scat and scatter them in Israel. Now why would he then say that I will divide them in Jacob? and scatter them in Israel because Jacob and Israel is the same thing you'll see that that is one of the reasons why Simeon and Levi what, what God had given them later on this what they have done counted a lot with God and it hindered and it obstructed and it restricted God to give them the full blessing of the situation. Now already here we see that the nation of Israel, the beginning, the initiation, the start of the nation of Israel, that already started doing something wrong. And because they are human beings and Jacob is not very very nice to them about this. And obviously God is not. That's why he, he records it for us. Then we see in verse 8 he talks to Judah. Judah, you are he whom your brothers shall praise. Judah means praise. Your hand shall in be on the neck of your enemies. Your hand, praise, shall be on the neck of your enemies. And he goes on and he tells them a lot about that situation, but I'm not going to go too deep, otherwise we're not going to get through the whole of the lecture. So we will go to verse 13 where he talks about Zebulun or to Zebulun. Zebulun means habitation. Habitation, he talks to Zebulun, he says, Zebulun shall dwell by the haven of the sea and he shall become a haven for ships. In other words, a docking yard, a place where ships can dock. He will be a haven for ships. That's what uh, Zebulun will be. And his border shall adjoin Sidon. Now Sidon in the Hebrew language means house of fish. House of fish. In other words, the ships that comes in with their merchandise will dock at uh, uh, Zebulun or Zebulun will be that place or his land or his place will be there where the ships can dock. In other words, like a Durban, a harbor city. But it will be next to Sidon where all the fish that were hunted and caught will be stored. House of fish, Sidon. But metaphorically, it also means, you know, Jesus said, lay down your nets and I will make you fishers of men.